on my computer. Okay, everyone. So, man, thank you for participating. You know, I like to do, man. This is definitely recorded. Um, if you missed it, I guess you got the recording. With not because I told y'all I like to start on time, which you know I do. Um, I just want to give you guys a quick little backdrop. So the disclaimer is for sure what we're sharing tonight is not advice. It's simply our opinions. Okay, I repeat, this is not advice, it's simply our opinions. Go ahead and consult with someone of the proper authority to do such to advise you when it comes to your finances, all right? Um, quick backdrop on how I met Neil. It's interesting and, you know, you always gotta pay attention to the signs. Very important to do this because um, it started with me wholesaling a fourplex that I now own the fourplex, so I didn't wholesale it. Um, and Neil came as one of the potential buyers for the property. And I remember Neil telling me when he met me there that um, he heard me talking about the Family Wealth Club and, and other things that, we, that, that we're doing. And he said, man, I'm not really even interested at the building at this price, but I wanted to keep my word and just come. And I believe God, now I see the bigger picture of why God got me here, right? So we exchanged information. And so I have bought another property from a, from a lady, um, good deal. And I noticed that, you know, the, the, the block is a very short block and we got, you know, one vacant house directly next to me. And I see this duplex across the street that I thought was empty on one side. Well, you know, it's an up and down duplex. I thought it was empty. And so I pull out my app and, you know, geolocate and click on the parcel to see who owns this property directly across the street. When I say directly across the street, I'm not exaggerating. Exactly across the street. I click on it and it says the owner is this guy named Neil Thompson. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is the Neil. I just met this guy over here at another property. You know what I mean? And so I called him up and I say, well, I text him. I say, Neil you own a property on such and such street? And he was like, yeah, that's my house. I said, get out of here, bro. I just got the other property directly across the street from you. And when those things start to happen, you have to pay very, very close attention. Now, of course, all during this time, I knew he was in the investing world, but I didn't know that he was from, you know, the, the big, big boys of fidelity. And in my younger days, you know, I had the 403B because I worked at a hospital. We didn't have a 401K, but it's their equivalent of, of that, where I was in the infamous Fidelity Magellan Fund. I was also in some other ones with Vanguard and stuff of that nature. So I was blessed enough to have a father in my life who implanted mutual funds into me so I can start thinking about investing like at 19, 20 years old and whatnot. But I'm saying this to say this, man, pay attention to the signs, the symbols, the synchronicities, because indeed they really mean something. And it's just for you to figure out what that is. And most importantly, to be able to get to decide to do, to do something to progress you and whatnot. So Neil has, a, he still has that property. I want that property, but I want it on terms. If I can get the property on terms, I'll buy him out of that thing, but I just got to make a couple transactions and whatnot. So those of you that's interested in learning real estate, um, I was able, I'm not going to do a screen share today, but y'all know my story. Um, I actually, I keep it uh, a physical one here, you know, when I'm out meeting people physically, but I was able to amass uh, within these nine units right here. It's a total of 19 doors in 18 months. We did it, and I always say that, you know, a millionaire on paper, if I sold all of them, it'd be a million dollars, you know, not minus the debt and stuff, but it's a million dollars in value just that fast in 18 months. Um, I take the slow drip way, meaning, you know, I want cash flow, but what happens when you don't have no money and you don't have no credit? In my opinion, you start off with this wholesale strategy, and I always say just for $100, you take $100 divided by 12 cents, that's 833.33. That's 833 phone numbers that you can get for just 100 bucks, okay? And then that means now you got the list, now you can start making these phone calls. Because that's, that's all you got, 833 potential leads is phenomenal to get started with just $100. 
Now you got to have the courage to make the phone call. If you have a little bit more money, it's easier, of course, but I'm showing you how you can get started in this space with just a hundred bucks. Wholesale is one of the most, man, phenomenal thing that I've ever come across. You know what I mean? And the essence of it is you get a house in contract for 50,000 and you agree that you're going to pay this 50,000 in 30 days. And then within that 30 days, you call people like Neil and you say, hey, I got a great deal for you. Can you do 65 for it? Neil comes, look at it. He sees value. He still can make money. And he says, I can do 65. Let's do it. And then what you do is you make a second contract called an assignment contract. And then you send that to Neil. Neil signs off on it. He agrees to pay 65,000. I take the first contract for 50. I take the second contract for 65. And I take these two together. I send them to my title company. Or if you're an attorney state, you send them to your attorney. He looks at them. They start running the title. And then the buyer, Neil, is going to wire his money in because nobody's coming face to face anymore anyway. But Neil's going to wire his money into the title company or the, or, or the attorney. And then the buyer, or I'm sorry, the seller is going to get their 50. And that $15,000 that's remaining is yours. It can get wired to your account or you can go pick it up. I like to pick mine's up and I go pick it up. So you're selling your interest in a contract. How much did it cost you? Whatever you did for marketing, $100 for 833 numbers, or maybe you beefed it up and you did a thousand postcards, whatever it is, you can make this happen. And that story and that math I just gave you was my first deal, $15,000 net profit. And I only mailed the lady two postcards and two letters. And the letter envelope that I used was like the FedEx type of envelope, because if you mail somebody that, they think it's important and they're going to open it. Now, I don't do everybody like that, but if there's a specific property that I really got my eye on, I always say my top five, then you need to take that extra step and stand out from the rest and mail them a FedEx envelope type of thing with a letter in there. Introduction, I would love to buy your property. Please call me. Let's go out to lunch. Uh, you know, Whatever it may be, work it. So it's very easy. But check me out, The Family Wealth Club, the new website, thefamilywealthclub.com. You can go to Real Estate to Millions. If I can do it, I always say, look, I'm dyslexic. I got ADD. I was held back in second grade. If I can figure it out, I know you can figure it out. But check out Real Estate to Millions, a 90-day thing. I'm going to be there with you step by step and putting you on base. Just giving you enough to get that person to call you back. Now, let's move to the next level. It's not automated when you don't see me. I'm right there in the trenches with you because I want you to get a deal. So check out Real Estate The Millions and also just check out the regular membership that we have for only 37 a month. You come inside of networks like this and you start powwowing. I get deals all the time and I pass them off to people in a group and may say, hey, here's a great deal on the table, $8,000 for the property. She only want 8,000 down. She'd take the remaining 7,000 in 18 months. And you don't have to pay no monthly payments on it because I already negotiated that I'm not paying no monthly payments. You just owe 7000 in 18 months. This is a real deal. There is a catcher to it. She owes some taxes. You now will take on that debt. So you'll put 20% down of the tax debt on that property. But your tenant is going to pay that bill for five years. Wipe that debt out. Your tenant is paying. And after year five, you start to get some nice cash flow seven to eight hundred dollars clear per month in your pocket it works like this we got great deals and my job is to find value and pass them to people like yourself so you can empower your family that's the key so what's up brother neil what's happening man hey hey hi can you hear me yes sir i can hear you i'm ready whenever you whenever you are all right so listen i'm going to make you the host just do me a favor um just unmute my line just in case you call on me and um, and let me okay. see. All right, all right, bam, there you go. Uh, do you want, uh, yes. All right, you should have that prompt. Okay, you you already uh, muted. All right, thank you, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, man, let's rock and roll, brother. Let's man. go here. Um, so just to piggyback on uh, Noble here, I, I we've talked about stocks before and there's many ways that to make money. I, Obviously, his game is uh, real estate, uh, but I I'm not sure if many of you guys heard the book, uh, uh, The Millionaire, Millionaire Next Door. That's what I kind of want to talk about, just the basics of investing for 
simple people like you and I, the everyday people like you and I, and you know, this is, I'm not preaching any type of get rich quick. What I'm talking about is long-term strategies of investing. I'm not sure how much you guys know. So if you raise your hands, I like uh, participation. So I don't, I don't need all your questions at the end. So if you have a question, uh, Noble's gonna be watching that and you can just, just ask the question. So I'm just gonna talk about the basics today. The basis of investing, the basis of st stock, mutual funds, bonds. And before I even start doing it, I'm gonna tell you what my key points are already. So when we get into them, you so you at the end you will know what his points was. My strategy is for you to systematically invest, and the better you start doing that, the better. So like tomorrow, uh, the, the, we're gonna talk about the compounding of interest. Have your money working for yourself, and know your time horizon. How long do you have to invest? Generally speaking, the longer you have to invest, the more risk you can take. I'm gonna back up one second and induce myself again is Neil Thompson. I did, like Anova said, I worked for Fidelity for eight years. I worked in a stocks and brokers department, trading stocks, bonds. Uh, in the end, I used to go around the country uh, uh, and for, to uh, speak to major companies about uh, investing in 401k for, they, for, their, uh, for their employees. So basically I gave them a similar presentation that I gave given to you guys. You know, you, in order to uh, win the game, you got to get in the game. And one of the ways to get in the games in stocks and mutual funds, just started systematically investing. Everybody follow me so far? Yes, sir, I'm with you. Great, you so let me just, let me. Thumbs up. One second, let me get this started, get to the beginning of it and we'll go from here. So even before I start here, I will say, that if you have a 401k or 403b with your job, you should max out that first before you start doing what I'm talking about. Because what I'm really talking about is what you're going to do on your own outside of your 401k, outside of your 403b or whatever your company has, outside of that, then we're talking about doing some investing for yourself. So if your company allows you to do put 20% of your salary in a 403b, then that the very minimum is you should be doing that if you can, because you doing that in your former case is exactly what I'm talking about, but now you're getting tax consequences. You're lowering your tax bracket, bracket by whatever you put in there. Everybody me follow me so far? Okay, well, let's get this part in there. We're gonna talk about what is investing? How does it work? Uh, what is your risk tolerance? Because everybody's risk tolerance is different. You know, if you're one of those people who's going to watch the market every day to see how much your balance has, has gone up or fallen, then, you know, you need to be in something more conservative. Uh, the types of investments, portfolios, and diversification. I'm going to try to stick to just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I, I'm not going to talk about ETFs. I'm not going to talk about cyber security, uh, Bitcoin, or none of that stuff. I'm just going with the basic stuff that you can invest in every day at your local brokerage company, at your local bank, or whatever you may have. Question is, what is investing? Definition, the act of committing money or capital to an endeavor with the expectation of attaining an additional income or profit. Or I like to say, just having your money work for you. You know, letting your money work for you. Investing is, it's not gambling because most of the time you're gonna do some research on your own, but it's putting your money in the market, whatever your tax, whatever your um, risk tolerance, tolerance is and based on how long you gotta invest, you kind of figuring out what's best for you. And then my goal is to have you guys systematically do that on a on an everyday basis, every week basis, every month basis. And so you might have your money just working for you going forward. Pretty simple. Everybody follow me? Yes, sir. Why invest? Uh, obviously, most people read this best because of retirement. How would you like to retire? I mean, I, I have a saying and I hope nobody works at Walmart, so I'm not trying to uh, trying to um, talk about anybody else. But when I retire, I don't want to be one of those older people in front of the store talking about welcome to Walmart. May I help you? I want my I want enough of my money working for me back that time. I get to pick and choose what I want to do. And I'm not saying those people can't pick and choose what they want to do. But based on what I know, they have to do that work. So um, my goal here is to kind of get you those stepping towards the area of paying for your re retirement in the future, whether you got 10 years to go or 30 years to go. And truth be told, the longer you have to go, the better situation you're in. 
um, we talked about retirement, we talked about Social Security. Most people don't think the Social Security check is going to be there for you for us when we retire. So I don't know if you can totally, um, totally depend on that. And so you need to have something. Uh, and I don't like uh, maybe our mother's generation or people who, who worked in the 60s and 70s. Back in those days, they had pensions where the government, where the uh, company gave you a set amount of money coming in every, every month once you retire. Most, most companies don't have pensions now. Most of them don't. So they, they took that away and gave us the 401k. And most of the time, they didn't educate the employees enough to have, them, have to invest in themselves. So that pension world is gone. Social Security check is probably gone. So what are you going to do to make sure you're ready when you do retire? Why invest? Invest money, money now allows financial flexibility for the future. The earlier you start investing, the easier it would be to establish a large amount of money. And this, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this um, picture, but it has a picture of somebody who started at age 20, one to start at age 30. They invested the same amount of money, but the person who started at age 20 had a longer time before they need the money. Therefore, she had the money she was investing was working for her longer. As a result, she has more money left over. She has more money at the end that she can use to invest. So the earlier you can start, the better. And I'm not saying it's not, it's not good if you start later because I truthfully started later. But when you start later, you're gonna have less time for your money to work for you. So I strongly encourage, encourage uh, the, the sooner you can start, the better off you're gonna be. Because the sooner you start, the more quicker the money will work for you. Everybody follow me? Absolutely. How does investing work? I think when I first started, I said three things I want to talk about is compounding. Uh, I think I said the time horizon and systematic investing. And um, compounding interest, pretty simple if you guys already know about investing, but it's the most powerful thing in investing. It's the most powerful thing that you're going to do. And it's basic too, but it's the most powerful thing out there. Compounding interest is interest calculated on the interest pr principle and also on the accumulated interest of previous periods. So basically, it's money, your money working for you, for you when, when you're not even doing anything. In our example, you invest $100 at 5% interest, compounded yearly. After the first year, you have $105. But after the second year, you only made $5, but you made money off the interest that you made on the, the first year. So in the second year, you're going to have, you're going to make an additional $5.25. So you had uh, $110.25. So you made $5.25 the second year just based off the interest you made off the first year. So you didn't do any things to have your money in the market making interest for you. Everybody follow me? And the more money you have out there working for you, the more money you're making. And this is a, this is a little side note. It's not, in, not on any of my um, screens, but you know, you cannot put your money in a bank and put it in a savings account and you're going to make any money. The, the system is set up that, 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 for you not to make money that way. So the bank is going to make pay you a minuscule amount of money. You will never get 5% from a bank. You'll be lucky to get 0.2% or 1% from a bank. And, when, and then if you put your money in the bank, let's say you got 50000 in there, they're giving you... 0.2 or 1%, but then they taking that money, loaning to us to buy houses, loaning us to buy cars, charging us four or five or 6% when they making all the money. So you will never make this type of interest at a bank. You have to go somewhere else to get that type of money. But that, that was a side note. It wasn't in my, on my notes, but you have to make your money work for you and putting your money in a local bank. You're not going to get that. We didn't test this at all, Noble, but let me see if this uh, video can work. And if you let me know if it don't work, we can just keep on going, okay? All right. Is it working? Not the sound. Okay. Okay, one second, one second.
I hear I'm sharing the screen, but I'm not. What did I do before to uh And it's not going to work, but the whole the whole video was talking about what I, what I just talked about compounding interest, how how the how you, how the your money that you earn interest on makes money off of that, and the more years you go, the more money that you you can make just by having your money out in the market making interest on it. So it just compounds, it builds over over time. It's going to make more and more money for you, even if you don't put any more money into it. So if somebody actually tell you that you would you want compounding interest or simple interest, you always want the compounding interest because the simple interest is gonna, just gonna give you that interest rate and that's it. You can never make money off the interest that you already made. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, sir. The second thing I told you I wanna talk about is that the time component of investing. So in the, in the business world, the financial, what they call it, what, what is the, the first thing I'm gonna ask you if you go talk to an advisor is, what is your time horizon? Uh, what is the time that you're gonna need this money back to use it? So if I'm if I'm 45 years old and I want to retire at 65, my time horizon for investment is gonna be 20 years. The longer you have to invest, the more risk that you can take. Generally speaking, if everybody have the same risk, the more time I have, the more I can, the more risk I can take. Now, if I'm at 62 years old and I need that money in three years. I need to cut my risk back. So I can invest in, if I got 20 years to go, I can invest in more risky stock. I can invest in more uh, small companies. I can invest in more technology type of companies because I have, even if the market crashes on me or doesn't go as well as I want it to go, I have many, much more time to recoup that money. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So in my example here, it says, uh, Jim invests $15,000 at age 20. And Sally invests fifteen thousand at age thirty-five. They both earn five percent interest compounded yearly, and both plan on taking this money out at age sixty-five. But since Jim is at the age twenty, talking about the compounded interest, he got more time and more years um, for that money to compound for him to work for him. And Sally, she has uh, she has fifteen years less. So the difference is. That he says he has more 15 years or more compounding, his money is gonna, uh, yeah, Jim's money is gonna make much more money for him in the future. So it talks about what we talked about the earlier. The earlier you can start, that you can get your money start working for you, the better off you're gonna be. Everybody with me? Yep, I got you. So time and compounding. Compounding accelerates your earning power. Compounding maximizes your earning picture of your investments. I, I like the little caption on the sides where it says the secret of life is compounding interest because that's the secret in, in your finances, having your money work for you. You must leave the initial investment and interest earned alone for this to happen though. So you can't just put a thousand dollars in and take it back out. You gotta let that thousand dollars earn the interest that it makes, and then the following year, let it earn interest on top of the interest. And over three to four to five to six, 20, 34 years later, this money is making money for you when you haven't did anything at all. And that's what most people don't think about it. So I'm not a big, I'm not, I'm not a big day trader. I don't totally believe in it because it just defeats what we're talking about here, where you long-term investing and have it work for you. You know, Day trading is trying to get in and try to get out. This is when you want to you want the, your interest and the returns work for you in the future. So the all the key we put up, which I mentioned earlier, is your risk tolerance. If you're a conservative person and you don't and you're going to be the type of person who's going to watch the market every day and look at your balance every day, and that the minute your uh, your account dropped five hundred dollars or thousand dollars you're gonna get a little scared then you you you, you risk averse which is okay which is okay that's just gonna determine what type of uh vehicles i'm gonna uh that you're gonna put your money in you're gonna want a little less risky type of uh investment uh but if you one of those people who go gambling on a regular basis to the um 
casinos and you don't and you don't mind and you whatever you invest you just put it out there and let it roll out there and it's not going to affect you know your life at all then you can take more risk but you got to know determine before you even invest what type of risk that you were willing to take and what what type you're not so the more risky you are like anything else in life the more risk the more reward but the less risk is going to be more conservative products that you get involved in and most likely the lesser the return obviously there's always exceptions but general rule is the more risk you could take the more rewards you're capable of getting factors that determine your risk tolerance is the amount of money you have to lose and i know somebody might be saying i don't have i don't have no money to lose but you know you put your money in the market not, none is guaranteed there can be a stock market crash there can be a dip in the market so that's a possibility that can happen but if you look at the history of the stock market, uh, it might have its ups and downs and, and, and um, uh, yeah, the ups and downs, but generally speaking, it is going up and down, but it's going constantly up on the long term. Again, we talked about earlier your, your time frame. So the closer you get to knowing, uh, needing the money that you're gonna, uh, you have invested, the less risk you have to take because you don't have, you can't have a dip or a stock market crash right before you retire. So by the time you hit 63 or 64 years old, you need to put your money into more conservative vehicles, whether it's you know, government bonds or cash or wherever it may be. Um, and, the, and your emotional ability to handle risk. So some people, like I mentioned before, they don't they want to take any risk at all. They're not a risk taking person. So if you're not, you just have to put your products or your money in a more conservative product. Each person is different. You need to identify the first couple of me is easily you know who you are and you know how long you have to invest uh but some people each person is different like i said so you need to determine you know how what well do i need this money and what i need to get it back but once you determine those things it, it can kind of guide you in what type of stocks or what type of mutual funds to to get involved in again there's no right or wrong answer to invest each person is different so you got to determine what's best for you So next we're gonna go over type of investments. And I get I, when I first started this, I said I was gonna stick, stick with the uh, basics. So we're gonna talk about bonds. We're gonna talk about stocks. I'm gonna talk about mutual funds. Um, before I begin, begin with the example, all a bond is, is, is uh, you loan the money to a corporation or the government, one of the two, you know? So um, in this example, your hometown decides to issue a municipal bond Typically, local uh, municipalities uh, raise these bonds for just for infrastructure, building new roads or building new buildings. You know, but they go, if it's the government, they have all taxing power. So, in this example, uh, municipal bonds with a hundred dollar face value, meaning you give them a hundred dollars, and that's how much the bond is worth. In this case, the bond will pay you two and a half percent per year. So after a year based off $100, you're guaranteed to get $2.50. So if you're very conservative and you just want to make some money off your money, then you're getting 2.5% per $100. So the total payback, and this is a five-year bond, the total you're going to get back in five years, you're going to get your principal back, which was $100, and you're going to get the interest with a total, which total $25. Did everybody get that? That's crazy. Why you say it was crazy? It's not enough money for you? Man, nowhere near, bro. <laughs> I, I agree. But if you're a conservative investor and you just want to make your money work for you, mm. that's not bad. Or if you at the end of your retirement and you got, let's say, $1.5 million. Yeah, yeah. And all you want to do is to get some interest to live off that money because, you know, so you can, when I, when I first got to Fidelity, I was amazed how many people were millionaires in America. Cause they would wow. call up every like Saturday morning, Sunday morning, just to check their balances. And right. all they, and all they did was to live off the money they already have. So they would have a cash reserve account and they would be paying them in those days, maybe two or 3% over years times over, you know, in, in a year, but they used to make 30, 20, 40, $50,000 in a year, just off their interest. Right. But they have, right. they had already made their money already. So they didn't just need to put it somewhere conservative to make interest off their money. So they want uh, doing it down their principal. And I saw it all the time. So it's a 
whole lot of um, um, millionaires next door to you that you don't know about. Right. So by the time you got to that amount of money, you can go put your money in bonds and just live off the interest if you got a couple million dollars in the bank. Right. There's some basic uh, basic bonds that we can talk about real quick so we can keep this going here. But the typical kinds is, is U.S. Treasury bonds by the federal government, uh, agency, agency bonds, which is still the government, or corporate bonds. Uh, corporate bonds is if, if let's, see, let's say P&G wanted to um, build a new uh, a factory and they don't want to use their own money. They would create these bonds. Usually they, most of the time, they're in like a $1,000 uh, certificates basically, and once they have the bond built, once that plant started making money for them, they would pay you back. So they can do it over five years, over ten years. It's anybody who don't want to, you know, go to the open market. They just want to get a loan from you. But we all know PNG ain't going nowhere, so they're gonna pay the money back. So if you want to make some interest in a corporate bond, it's more risky than a government bond because the government government had the all taxing power. So you're going to make more money on a corporate bond than you are a, a government bond. So if you want to make 3 or 4% instead of 2.5%, you go to corporate bond, make sure that's a reputable company, then you can, you'll get your $1,000 back, but you'll make 3 or 4% also. And the last is the high-yield bonds. You can make more money off of those, but if it's a high-yield bond, nobody's going to give you more interest without more risk. So if it's a high yield bond, it won't be PNG. It could be some X, Y, and Z company that's just been in business ten years. They're trying to grow, grow, but they don't. Big, they're not big enough to go on the stock market or do an IPO. So it's going to be a little bit more risky because they don't. They're not on in every country and, and all over the U.S. So it's it's more risky. But you're taking more risk. They're going to pay you more interest. That's why I call you a call it a high yield bond because it is more risk. I'm gonna skip over that. That just talking about each bond is graded by different different groups of people, and they can tell you how risky the bond is. It goes from AAA down to COD with junk bonds. Depend on your risk level, but most people want the the higher grade bonds. Next, I'm gonna go to st stocks, and I think we all. Um, have a least a familiarity with stocks. And um, the two ways stocks make money. Um, first is the price go up. So I, what most people tell you with, at beginners investing is find something that you naturally buy. So if you go to Walmart all the time, you know, and you know they're gonna be in business forever and you're gonna do this on a long-term basis, that may be a good stock for you. Or if you just love the Apple products, the iPhone, the Mac, the iPad, um, and you've been you've been rock rocking with Apple for the last 10 years since the iPhone one, two, or three, or whatever the case, you know they're gonna be in the business for a while, that may be a good stock for you. So typically you wanna invest in what you what you know. What what do you, what do you support on an everyday basis? Um and I'm going to add a couple of things to it. I say you want to invest in stuff that you know and that you think it still has a chance to grow because stocks price goes up based on their ability to grow or earn money. So, you know, if, if you're going to invest in PNG and they've been around over 100 years and they're already in every country already, it's only so much that they can grow on. I mean, if, if they're in, already in every country already, they don't have no new territories. You know, if they sell in 10 billion a year, it's still 10 billion, but they, they can never get to 15 billion because they already there already. It's a good stock. But if you're looking for a lot of growth, I'm not sure how much PNG can still grow. But one of the ways you can make money on PNG is by getting that stock. And they're making so much money now that they give out dividends. They take part of the profits and give it to the shareholders. So if they give you $100 a, $100 a year, $200 a year, 
you that that's money that's in your pocket that you can earn, or you can turn around and automatically have them buy more shares of that stock for you. So either way, the stock price grows, or they so established at this point that they have so much profit that they give it back to you. Either way, either way is good. Either way is good as long as you're making more money than you had originally. Is everybody okay with that? Everybody follow me with that? Yes, but sir. there's no guarantee in stocks. So what if happens if you uh you you had a stock of PNG and, and for whatever reason PNG without bankruptcy? It's not a loan like a bond, so that you, you can never go back to them. You was a shareholder. So with that, you lose all your money. So that's why you need to invest in something that you know that you're gonna constantly support, that you know is gonna be around for a while. Because you taking risks, you part owner of the company. And if the if you owner of a company, whether it's a big company or small comp company, if it does not do well, then you just lose all your money. I'm gonna repeat myself here again, but the risk of being owning stocks is shareholders are not guaranteed any return if the company goes bankrupt. No guarantee that the shareholders will receive dividend payments. So if the company's not doing well, if they have a down year, like in COVID, if, if, if a company wasn't doing as well because let's say Disney, keep, people couldn't go to the parks, they might, they might stop giving dividends at the time until COVID is over with. Here's the bright side. Stocks generally outperform other investments due to their higher risk. Historically, stocks average 10 to 12% return. So going back to my thing earlier about, you know, um, can't put your money in the bank when a bank is giving you, you know, point some point percent of 1%. But if you had your money in the stock market, this says that the average stock uh, has a return of 10 to 12%. And I'm not sure if we all know this, but inflation is pretty much running 3% every year. So if you got your money in the bank and you're getting less than 1% and inflation is running 3%, you lose the money. You might be thinking you are saving your money, but you your buying power is, is losing. So that's why you have to be in something that's making more than what the inflation is doing. Doing what NOBA does in uh, real estate or the stock market. On average, it's going up about 10% a year if you look at it on a long-term basis. Any questions out there, NOBA at all in the chat? Nope, they said makes sense. Okay, cool. This is uh, just talking about how stocks are made. And this is probably uh, how stocks are traded. This is probably something we're not gonna talk about now. So I'm gonna go to the next slide here. This is talking about primary and secondary market. The primary market is uh, IPOs. Pretty much none of us is gonna be on the floor of, I of IPO. So anything that we buy at this level is gonna be on the secondary market where you can go to your local brokerage or your, oh, your discount brokerage firm and buy the stocks Anything on that from your broker's department is going to be the secondary market. Something that has already had an IP already. So when you buy a stock, why does the prices change? Stock is, like I said earlier, the, uh, it's volatile. Stocks, and, and it changes in price daily. And it, it's all about the supply and demand. Uh, unfortunately, stocks really uh, fluctuate based off of uh, what the earnings are. Companies have quarterly earnings every quarter. And every quarter, people sit there and wait, wait for those earnings reports to determine how well that company did or did not do. And they adjust or they buy and sell based off of that. But those just just one or two things, you know. But if you think, like I said, Apple has, has plenty of room to grow, or if you believe that Amazon is keep splitting off itself off and started buying, getting into other industries now <laughs> to into the healthcare or the medicine or the um, prescription drug business. If you think they're gonna take that over, then you think they, they you still think they have room to grow. And if you think Amazon still have room to go, it may be a good buy for you. Me and Noble talked about it, and I think I think Amazon. This this is not an advice. This is my opinion. I think they're gonna become a, a transportation company. You know, I think they're gonna compete with FedEx and UPS, but that's just my belief based on what they've done in the past. But if you think a company still has plenty of room to grow, 
then that may be a good I buy an opportunity for you. But there's really a lot of things why it changed and it depends on the economy. So if the economy is not doing well, you know, your company can be the stock that you purchase can get penalized, even though it's still doing well. Because if the economy is not doing well, then pretty much everybody's thrown in the same, the same, the same bag. So your company can be doing well, but the stock is dragged down just based on what the company is doing. So that's why if you buy stocks, you really, in my opinion, need to be in there long term. This this talks about how to how to evaluate stocks, and this is probably getting a little bit more detailed and uh, something we probably didn't talk about if we ever do this again. But every person has a has their own way, just like Nova has his own way of evaluating, evaluating real estate. You need to determine how you evaluate if it's a good buy or not. Obviously, you want to purchase with with good value, so you have room to grow. But each calculation is really dependent on that person and how they how they evaluate a stock. So I would recommend to any new investor, mutual funds. Um, and a mutual fund is an investment vehicle that consists of a pool of funds contributed to many investors in order to invest in stocks, bonds, or other assets. Or what I like to say is a mutual fund is, instead of you going by Apple, Amazon, you can go buy a growth stock, a growth mutual fund, and they can pick, they can pick 100 different uh, companies for you. You know, they all based off the research, based off the analysts, has the potential to grow. But now you don't, you don't have your all your money in one or two stocks. So this is a good way to cut down risk in, with your money. Um, so most people recommend uh, new investors to go in mutual funds and specifically um, an index fund. So an index fund is going to have a lower cost and what a what an index fund is, and just depending on which one you get, it's just going to try to mirror whatever. Let's say the most popular one out there is an index 500. It's going to try to mirror the, the top 500 stocks in the market. So whatever the market is doing is going to mirror that for you. So you diversify with 500 stocks that you own. So you, if, if one stock does bad, you still got 499 that's have the potential, potential of doing well. So you don't have all your all your money in the in the proverbial all your money in the all in one basket basically, and for a new investor, the person who's trying to learn, to me that that is probably the best way to start out. Questions, comments, or anything? The advantage of mutual funds, like I said, it gives small investors access to professional investment help by allowing them to invest in diversified portfolios. If you get into a managed fund, so if it's not an index fund, and it's like I think Noble said at the beginning, it used to be part of a, a Fidelity Magellan. Magellan has, I don't know how many, 10, 15, 20 people just working on that fund. They have a fund manager, associate fund manager, analyst, they research stock. So they getting paid to invest your money if you put that money in that, that particular fund and before you go look up that fund, that fund has been closed for years now, so you can't get into that fund. But, you know, each fund has a fund manager, analyst, research analyst. They have a, a host of people looking to find out what's the best stocks to invest in based off the description of that fund. So if it's a growth fund, all they're going to have is growth stocks. All We're going we're gonna to invest in all growth companies for this particular growth fund. If it's a growth and income fund, you're gonna have potential growth companies, but a lot of well-established companies that's given a lot, given off a lot of dividends, so you can get income along with growth. So you need to again determine uh, what your risk tolerance is, it, uh, determine how much you have, how long you have to invest, and then you can select the mutual fund that kind of meets your goals, meet your time horizon, that meet your your uh, your risk concerns. So the again the, the disadvantages of a uh, managed funds is it has more fees. Unlike an index fund, which is pretty much ran by computers, a mutual fund is ran by computers and human. So with the human effect, the research is going to cost more money. 
So it's cost. So the the more money they charge you, the more that the less money you can invest. But I still say that is way much better than a new person going and try to pick his own stock. Types of investment mutual funds is pool funds, is aggregated investments from many individuals from all across the country putting their money in this mutual fund. So if I have a $10 million mutual fund, I have much more buying power. The cost for me to buy those stocks is gonna be cheaper than me going about going out and buy 10, 10 shares of a stock myself. The, the cost when they don't is gonna be much cheaper. Again, the disadvantages of a mutual fund, especially if it's a, a managed mutual fund, is the manager fees, the capital gains. So if you buy a mutual fund and hold it for six months and you sell it, you're going to have capital gains. But obviously, if you have capital gains, then, then you made some money. So it's not all too bad, bad. So you need, you need to determine if you want somebody to actively manage the money for you mutual fund or you want an index fund, you just want to do, since the, historically the funds have a 10 to 12% 10 to return, then if you want to get an index fund, it would keep your costs down, so that's more money that you can invest, but it's not actively managed by any type of human at all. Some of these next slides is talking about ETFs. I'm not going to go into this much more, but the difference between ETFs and mutual funds is you can buy and a buy and sell ETFs. They really mutual funds that you can buy and sell just like their stocks. That's the biggest difference. So, because a lot of people, um, you only can buy and sell mutual funds once a day at the end of the day. But with ETFs, it's the same thing as a mutual fund. You can buy those just like a stock. So I'm almost to the end of this here. Uh, I just want to talk about portfolio and diversification. Um, what I'm talking about tonight is more long-term. It's important for long-term goals, such as retirement, or if you, need, if you need money in five to 10 years for your college education for your child, you know what the time horizon is. Um, so you, you can better select what you want to purchase at that time. But if you need something, if you got a child that's a junior in high school, you know you're gonna need that money in two years, you wanna take less risk because you don't save for 10 or 12 years for that child. You don't want that as something risky within the next year, you're gonna need that money and now that money could just sink. So the closer you get to the, when you need that money, the more conservative, generally speaking, that you should be. So portfolios and diversification go hand in hand. The less diversified you are, the more risk you're taking. The next few scales uh, uh, slides are just showing you based on your risk tolerance, your time horizon, how much you should have your uh, money split between bonds, fixed income and equities or stock. Um, and I just gave you the general overview. The more, the more time you have, the more equities or stock that you should be in. So um, I'm not sure how much more time we have, Noble, but I know we're getting, we passed the half hour already. So I just want to reiterate what I think is very important uh, if you're starting off investing. Uh, you should audit, so you, this, I didn't even mention this, but uh, most important thing I think is systematic investing, um, compounding interest and let your money work for you. And then the longer the time horizon you have, uh, the more risky you can take. So. If you started a fund tomorrow, as long as you set up a automatic withdrawal from your account, like $100 a month, you can start just with $100 a month. And every 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 month, they would take $100 out your checking account, savings account to invest in whatever you want them to invest in. So with systematic investing, it really takes out the whole trying to time the market because nobody can time the market. But if you systematically invest in diligently every month, every week or every every two weeks or whatever your pay period is, this is again, after you put the max in your form, okay? Then you systematically invest, you uh, pick the right um, fund for you as far as how much, uh, when will you need the money, how much risk you can take, and then you it will systematically invest. You, 
you don't have to try to guess what the market is going to do because nobody can. So if you systematically invest, you're going to be in with the good times, you're going to be in with the bad times, and it's going to average itself out. So um, my thing for you today, again, is to make sure you um, have your money work for you. So that's the compounding interest. Start as soon as possible so time can work in your favor and systematically invest whatever money you do have outside of your 401k because we need to max that out first. I'm done here, Noble. If anybody got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer, answer any questions. Absolutely, absolutely, man. If y'all got anything in the chat, go ahead or put your hand up and we can unmute your line. Um, talk to me, Neil. Talk, talk to me about, um, you mentioned Amazon. You believe they got room to expand and they're going to go into transportation, in your opinion. Mm -hmm. um, give us the reason why you think that and then is there any companies that you think they may be teaming up with or already teamed up that that warrants your um, opinion? Well, I, I don't have no problem to answer that, but somebody had their hand raised. So you want to answer that question first? Um, Who is K Money? Yeah, let me get to him. Uh, K Money? Hold on. Oh, you got to do it. Um, unmute the line because you're the host. Okay, my bad. Hold on. Peace, peace. How you doing, uh, Mr. New? Pretty good. How you doing, good. bro? Good, good. Thank you for doing the call. And Ampu, thank you for inviting us. Um, yeah, just wanted you. to quickly ask you because you kind of, you went over the ETFs, but you kind of skipped over the cryptocurrency market. So I just want to kind of get your take on the cryptocurrency market. I know it's been the, the hot thing lately. Some people like it. So I just want to kind of get advice on I, that market. I, I'm not sure if I'm the person that asked that because I don't invest in it. Uh, so me and Nova had a conversation about this a couple of times. So I'm not sure if I can honestly answer your question because I, I just, it's not, it's not regulated enough for me for one. So, and, and, and uh, over the last week or so, I know the government, the China government has come out and is trying to regulate it more. And that, that's when everything started dropping. So I just like to see something that I can, uh, I'm a, I guess I'm conservative when it comes to that. I want something I can see, I can touch. I can go to Walmart. I can get an iPhone. I can feel and touch that. That uh, big com, I don't, I'm not the one to answer it. So I'm not saying that it's bad or good because some people have made a lot of money on it, but I really can't speak to that. I know that's not the answer you wanted though. Yeah, man. Neil from the old school right now. Yeah, yeah, man. Neil from the old school. So he 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 observing. He he watching it. No. I'm watching, yeah. Yeah. So back to Amazon, your question is, um, most companies, if they've been around for any length of time, 20, 30, 40 years, most of them are not still doing, well, I take that back, most of them is, they are doing other things than what they started out doing. They may be still doing, you know, a lot of stuff they're doing, like, like Disney, Disney still have theme parks, but now they're into streaming. Now they own ESPN. They're doing a lot of things. The companies who don't evolve go out of business. Sears, for one. Kmart, for one. So, you know, Amazon started off as a, um, a bookseller. That's how they started. Then they started doing CDs. They started doing toys. Now they got the big, bigger, biggest web services out there. And that was on accident. So if you look at their history, what they're trying to do, they're they trying to get uh, products to individuals. And so they really tired of depending on UPS and FedEx. They want to they want to control the cost to get their costs lower. So they have a, now you see Amazon 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 trucks all over the place. You didn't see that 2 or 3 years ago. Now they own airplanes. They probably own 100 airplanes. They didn't own airplanes 3 or 4 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you saw maybe last year they had a big dispute with FedEx and they just stopped using FedEx. Ooh. They, they totally they just stopped using them so they're gonna have to make that up so what they in my reading and, and researching them they're trying to make sure they can take care of they want to get to the place where they can deliver their own products first and after that just like the uh web services because the web services was only created for amazon but now they're the biggest web services in the world but once they mastered it 
and they took care of all their needs, they took it to the public. Or like now they got they got Walgreens and CVS and any any drug company scared because now they're trying to start selling drugs. You know, not drugs, but they're trying to be a pharmacy. So even though they really became, they was a uh, online retailer, they have branched off to do quite a few other things that still has plenty of time to grow. So I, I think I mentioned earlier about how, how much can a company that you invest in, how much can it grow? You know, you know everybody knows Xerox, but Xerox almost went out of business. Yeah. Now they're not into copiers. They, they're more of a consulting company. They had to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. So one of the things they teach you in school is how well, how well is their management? Can their management ad adapt to the time to change, change what, you know, what they're doing to go do something else? You know, back in the day, General Motors, all they want to do is keep those big, you know, Cadillacs, and those big cars. But, you know, the gas crunch happened and they wanted people on the smaller cars. But they didn't adapt. They didn't adapt fast enough. So how well can the, the, the management adapt to it? How well can they adapt to the change in the economy or the change of people needs? You know, and do they still, can they branch off and take their cash cow and go do other things that has a potential to bring in more money? Right. Has Amazon bought into or teamed up with any companies in the, in the freight business? Well, they got partnerships with UPS. Um, and they got partnerships with all these companies. So all those trucks that you see on the road, like those 18 wheelers that has Amazon uh, trailers on it, yeah, Amazon on the trailers, but they don't own the trucks. So they, they have contracted with small time trucking companies all over the country. So they, those trailers are Amazons, but those, those guys driving those trucks, those are all contractors. Gotcha. They're all contractors. And that's how they keep their costs down because we ain't got to pay you benefits. You know, those people who deliver your package to you, you know, every day, they're not Amazon employees. They're contractors too. Yeah. I got you. So today, with Neil is today, and of course, you know, just today in your in your mature age, um, what's, what's your top five for you personally, if you don't mind sharing? Well, I, I'm a... Uh... I'm an Amazon believer, so we, you know, we, you already know that. Um, I'm an Apple believer. I, I, I took a risk with uh, <laughs> Tesla uh, because I think, I think the, uh, this is my personal opinion. I think uh, 10 to 15 years, man, you know, all cars is gonna be battery, you know, and the ones that's gonna be, that's not gonna be any more uh, gas driven cars, you know, being made. It's gonna be still dri driving around, but not new. Not no, you ain't gonna see no 2000 and, you know, 31 car being made that's been, uh, that you're gonna put gas in it. That's just my opinion. Gotcha. My opinion. And I think General Motors came out with something last year saying by X amount of years, eight to 10 years, that they're not gonna have any cars that's not, a, you know, new, that's not electric. You know, so if you watch the financial news, you can kind of, kind of see, kinda, you know, it, some of it's just a guess, but with, uh, with all the emissions and all the, um, what they call it is changing of the weather and uh, global warming. Yeah. They're, trying to change, they're trying to stop all that emission. So most car companies are trying to get away from gas guzzling cars. Okay. That's my opinion. So Tesla, uh, Amazon, um, Apple. Apple. This is my opinion. That's not advice. We saying that again. For sure. This is and, my and, opinion. And, and give me, get, what's your starting five? What's your other two? Uh, um, I'm a big uh, Apple guy, not Apple, but a Disney man. I I think they're gonna compete with uh, Netflix in the streaming the streaming war. Man, that's just my opinion. Okay, okay. And, uh, it's interesting because I just subscribed to something on Disney because they had a movie that was only on Disney, and I ended up paying for the streaming. But I forget what it was. I think it was Soul, the move, the little kitty movie right. Soul was on Disney, and I had to get it. Uh, go ahead. So Disney and your fifth one. Um, the fifth one I told you about this. Uh, this um, this logistics airplane company, I, I think of uh, Amazon is going to buy out in next next year or two. And that's a long term. That's a riskier because it's, it's a small company, man. But I I believe that Amazon's going to eventually buy them out. Who who are they? What are they name? Um, they out they, they they in Ohio, right? Um, yeah, women. It's called Air Transport Services Group. Air Transport Services Group. 
Yeah, that's just my opinion. I don't have no proof, but they own 10 to 15 percent of them. You know, the, uh, Amazon pretty much goes out and just buy people. They bought Whole Foods. They bought anything they get into. They try to go buy a company that's already doing it. And they just put money into them so they can grow. Gotcha. Yeah, I hope you got that, man. We we got we got Neil. So you, know, you got a, do you, do you have a top five? I do not. Uh, okay. I'm a real estate dude. Um, okay. I, I so I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't. Um, but it's a it's a whole lot of good companies out there besides the ones I pick, man. I I got a watch list. I watch maybe 30, 40 of them companies right. on a regular basis. So you know those right. are the ones that came in my head. But you know, like I said, I in every company I told you, I think they still have potential to grow. Right. I still think, you know, I still think they have potential to grow because I think Disney is killing it on the streaming services. Gotcha. And, they, and they got and they got the money to put into it too. That's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, been around forever as well. Right. Got you. But you, now you mentioned financial news. Where do Neil get his financial news from? What, what are you watching or reading on a consistent basis to tune in to finances? Well, like anybody else, man, I watch CNBC all the time, man. So, mm -hmm. you know. They give you the latest breaking news and in any magazine, whether it's newspaper, USA Today or CNN, I go to the business section first. That's just me. Gotcha. You know, so it's because, all it's all CNBC for you. Are you yeah. a re are you a reader? Wall Street oh Journal, yeah, or? yeah. I I read I read all that, man. Yeah. You know, like like Tesla, man. Uh, they make more than fifty percent of their money. It's not off of cars, mm -hmm. so they diversify. That's what I liked about it. They, they most of the half their money don't come from selling uh, bet, you know, battery driven cars. Mm -hmm. well, where is it coming from? Uh, they sell, they sell some of their technology to other people. They got all type of government contracts to to improve help improve improve emissions. So yeah. they, you know, just you know, we know them as Tesla, and that's their brand. But now all their money is coming from uh, selling I cars. You. I got you. I got you. Yeah, anybody got a question? Raise your hand in the chat. Raise your hand in the chat. We can get to you. Let me scroll down, make sure. I don't see anybody. We got K Money. Or you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute your line. Miss Felicia, you're so welcome. She said, "Give yeah, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, oh, there we go. I thought I just saw somebody. Hold on. We're going to, you see Phil in the chat? Um, Neil, they got their hand up. Yeah, I just, I muted, I think. Did I? Yes. Hello? Okay. Hey. Yes. Hi. Hey, family. Thank you, uh, Mr. Neil. Everything's been very informative. Um, I'm trying to, so hopefully there's no echo. K Money's upstairs, I'm downstairs. So hopefully <laughs> there's not an echo. Um, you were talking about stocks earlier and I wanted to know, um, you seem like you're, you're uh, well informed about all of this. I wanted to know, do you have like a top three or top five list of stocks that give off the highest dividends um, that you, in your, like your, top three i know you don't want to like give us um you can't suggest to us what we should invest in but what would be like your top three or top five uh stocks with the highest dividends i don't have that but oh. i have done this quite a few times if you just google top 10 uh dividends uh stocks it's going to give you the top 10 companies out there right now ah. that, that does that okay you know one okay. of one of the companies that always give a dividend but I just read they might cut their dividends, AT&T, mm -hmm. you know, ah, but AT&T, if you, go, if you go to their page, if you look at all the companies they own and all of most of them is mature. So they, that means they just raking money in. They may, can't, they, they may not can grow because they're already so big, but now they got this cash just coming in, just coming in, you know. Okay. And so that's, then they take that money and give it back out to their shareholders. And then, so the price, stock price is not going to go up, but you're getting more money from them or you're getting, you're reinvesting that money they give you to buy more stock. But either way, it's making your value and AT&T going to go up. Gotcha. Another okay. company, I don't know where they are on the top 10 list, but if you think about it, it makes sense. It's Coca-Cola. 
<laughs> they like they like PNG. Everybody drinking cola, Coca Cola, and it's all over the world. So how much can they grow? They may yeah. can't grow a lot, but they they kicking out profit every every quarter, every quarter. So the stock price might not be coming up, uh, going up, but they giving you money back. And if you buy more Coke shares, that's bringing your portfolio up, or they sending you a check or dropping the check somebody in your bank account. Either way, you get money off of that, off that investment. Okay, and can I ask one more question? Sure. Okay, um, so as far as it's like uh, managing like your stock portfolio, um, I have experience with both Fidelity and TD Ameritrade. Do you have someone that you uh, like have better experience working with other than those two or could recommend or do you think those they're good to go? <laughs> um, when you get to get your companies like that, they all going to do the same. TD Ameritrade, okay. Fidelity. I think TD American Trade, I think. I'm quite okay. so but if you get Fidelity, Schwab with the with the ball TD Ameritrade or Vanguard, they all gonna do the same thing. Okay. I happen to have Vanguard because I didn't want to go to Fidelity because I used to work at Fidelity. But ah. you're gonna get this, you're gonna get the same service. Those are uh main brands of the of the field as discount brokerage. So you, you really can't go wrong with any of those. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, Phil. Um, <clears throat> we got a question in the chat. What do you what What is your take about the AT and T merger? Uh, which one? I mean, which which so with who? Maybe not I'm familiar with that. Yeah, I'm not. They said they was watching CNBC and thought it was interesting. So Nicole, who who did they merge with? Well, I'm so in my bubble. I have no idea they did a merger. <clears throat> who are they merging with? AT and T. Uh, Warner Media and Discovery. I, I I really don't have an opinion of it to be truthful because I've seen I've seen those things go really well and I've seen them go really bad. So you know, I, this is my opinion. Sometimes those companies like AT and T and so big, they can't they can't grow fast enough. They're just looking to buy people to grow. You know, but I've seen a lot of those things get uh get bought out and they didn't know how to integrate the companies and it, it was just a waste of time. So with mergers, it's almost like um, you got to wait and see. It's almost like the NFL draft. You got to wait and see what the guy do on the field. You know, they can look as good as all they want to until they stop playing. So if they can merge those companies and get some synergies, you know, it's just, it's anybody guess at this time, in my opinion. Gotcha. Gotcha. <clears throat> Let me, um, they said they was thinking that as well. Let me ask you this, Neil. What is your favorite self-development book that you read? Um, <laughs> I guess it's one that, uh, <laughs> that every, I, I got, well, let me just answer your question. Um, it's everybody's favorite, which was, which Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, uh. Yeah, but I'm not sure who's on here, man. But this my other self development book, man, is um, and they say I don't know if you got different diversification people in here, but it was a book called Why um Why White Guys Got to Have All the Fun. Yeah, yeah, Dennis Kemper. Uh, no, it was the Reginald Lewis story. Who is it? Reginald Lewis. Reginald Lewis. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, that yeah. book inspired me, yeah, man. Yeah, he got, he got like this. Yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that book inspired yeah. me. So I, yeah. I probably read it two or three times. So just okay. dude from the hood of Baltimore, just like the rest of us, and right. he out there making deals, man, buying companies with leverage buyouts, like somebody like PNG or something, man. So that yeah. was that was impressive yeah. for me. Gotcha. That's a very good book to read, man. Gotcha, gotcha. And 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 your favorite business book. That probably would be it. But if you got one that's more on the business side, what, what would it be? Well, I read books a lot. Mm -hmm. So I read one, man, last year called, oh, man, what was it called? I had it in my office. It's, uh, um, it was called, I don't know the name of it, but basically how capitalism worked. And it was the guy who, who helps, he was the finance guy behind the Home Depot. Mm. He wasn't. The, he he wasn't the people who put it together, but he was. He worked on Wall Street. And he matched them up 
with the, the money they needed to start it. He again, he started out just like you and I went to school, went to business school, and went for went for working for a brokerage company, got into investment banking, and man, he just started making money by putting deals together, man. Just you know, like you do it on a small scale, but he was just doing it on a major scale. Yeah, gotcha. And I gotta, I gotta say one more, bro. This is nothing to do with business. This is who I am. Um, and I hope you don't kill me after this call. But I, I'm a Christian, and I read a book called How Faith Works, man. Uh -huh. And that, that that changed my life, man. So I, I probably read that book three or four times too. Because if you're an entrepreneur like we are, uh -huh. you got, you got to have some faith to step out there. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's no, that's dope. And my my main partner, he he like noble. The Bible is the greatest book ever written. Yes, it is. I, I agree with him, man. But you yeah, know, he, like, he tackle that thing from a whole nother. He don't deal with history. He deals with each character is a representation of a certain state of consciousness that the human being goes through and be crushing it, bro. I mean, crushing it. Well, I'm going I'm to add to that and I'm going to switch the subject because I know this ain't a Christian thing, man, but everybody always talking about getting to the next level. Mm -hmm. I believe you can't get to the next level without getting more faith. Right. That's just right. my belief. Right. You know, I can't get to the next level with my same faith. Right. Right. Absolutely, man. And um, yeah, anybody got something, man, before we wrap it up, go ahead and put your hand up or drop it in the chat. Um, what's, what's your biggest, not necessarily loss. Let's just call it a lesson. What has been your biggest lesson that you've learned? Ooh, bro. And if it was a loss financially, if you don't mind sharing that. Oh, I don't, I don't mind sharing it, man, because I don't, I don't want nobody to make the mistakes I made, bro. Um, when I first quit my job, bro, I, uh, when I first got out of corporate America, when I left the Delta, I bought a, I bought a laundromat. Hmm. And it was the worst mistake that I made. And I'm not saying laundromat is not a good business, but I, you know, don't ever do anything for his business without a, te without a team. And I didn't have a team. Mm -hmm. I thought because I'm, I thought I was smart, I had an MBA, I can go work this deal myself. So you should always, it's worth you investing $1,500, $2,000 to get you a good lawyer. It's worth you giving somebody $1,000 an accountant to look at it because we get emotional or tired to things and we want things to happen. Mm -hmm. But get you, get you a, make sure you have a team before you start going doing something because I'd rather give somebody three or four thousand dollars and they tell me not to do it than don't save in three or four thousand dollars and go do it. And it's the worst mistake of my life. So don't be don't be cheap. Get you a team. Get you some advisors. Get somebody who's who's doing what you're trying to do who who can show you. So a mentor, mm -hmm. whatever. But don't think you can do it by yourself because that's I thought I could do it by myself, man. I, and I lost my shirt. Yeah, man. So how, how much did you lose on that deal? hundred thousand dollars. A hundred K? Yeah, easily. And how and how long did you have a laundromat? The, the laundromat was losing money the minute I opened it up. Okay. And if I would have had any type of team around me, they would have told me not to do it. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it wasn't already standing and you bought it turnkey? It was standing, but it, it just, all the machines were old and beat up. Okay. And then I gave them all my money and I didn't have money to, to improve the place. Mm -hmm. So, but anybody who wasn't emotionally tied to it would have pulled me to the side and told me, don't do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, it, and if you would have asked me that question three or four years ago, I, I don't know if I could have got it out, but now I'm over it. I'm healed and, and I, I want to help somebody else not to do the same mistake I made. Gotcha, I gotcha. And your, your, what would you say your biggest success today um, one of your, what I mean by that is your favorite um, acquisition, in a sense. Um, I, I got I got two, I guess. One is I just happened to me uh, this past week, man. I uh, I got with some brothers who was kind of was in real estate, and I invested with them a solid money in the syndicate, and we bought a um, we bought an apartment complex in North Carolina, and I just looked at it when I. I just looked at it when I gave my check and it was two years ago this month. Uh -huh. And um, and we're about to sell it. And I'm about, about, I'm about to make triple my money in two years. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, that's definitely a win. I was, I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. And the second one, man, is I, you know, I work, I work, um, I have a company working with people with developmental disabilities. Uh -huh. So 
to me, what's amazing about that is I'm making good money, but I'm also helping somebody else. And, you know, you know, many of us have, I've had jobs where I hated the job, but I need the money to take care of the family, the kids or whatever. Right. You get in the bed and you wish you never wake up or can't wait to the weekend. Well, every day I get up, man, I'm helping people less fortunate than me and they pay me very good about it. So to me, it's like, I, I can't get no better than that. That's dope, man, that's dope. And, and here's our final question from K Money. When did you know that entrepreneurship was the direction you should go? Um, I don't know if this is everybody, this ain't gonna be everybody's story, man, but I kept, I, I got tired of working for others and they put, they, and they put a limit on how much I can make. They're going to tell me every year, invite me into one of those side rooms in the, in the office and, and go over my uh, evaluation. And no matter how well I did, you know, two or 3% raise. And man, I, just th I thought I had more value than that. So I started telling myself that everybody should be smart enough to at least go out there and do something to make their current salary. And, I, and everybody don't think that way, but that's just how I felt. And I remember, you know, I, I left, a, left a financial company and I remember when, when I got close to quitting, my coworkers looked at me and said, Neil, uh, so what you gonna do about 401k? And man, I just said, I just, oh, right before that, the guy who ran the whole, whole the whole um, tri-state tri area for Cincinnati, you know, he was probably making quarter of a million dollars at the time. That was 20, 15 years ago, which is a lot of money. And I told them, I said, I think I should make as much as him. I don't think he's no smarter than me. Of course, they, of course they, they laughed. But, you know, man, it, it comes to time where you got to believe in yourself or you don't. And I just chose to bet on myself. Gotcha. I got you. I got you, man. And if you want to share any contact information, man, um, social media or things of that nature, man, um, go ahead. I, uh, I love helping other people. So I don't, I don't need, uh, you would never call me and say, hey, I would, I would give you this advice for a fee. You would never get that from me. So uh, if you can, I, I, if you can my email uh, in the uh, chat and I can, you, uh, I can give my number too, but my email address is neil, N-E-I-L dot Thompson, T-H-O-M, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N 60 at yahoo.com. And my uh, cell phone number, you can reach me anytime at 513-317-5315. Yes, Shamaya, he's in your area. Absolutely. Uh, she asked what you're from Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Well, thank you, man. I definitely appreciate it. We definitely got to do this again. And because um, it's something I want to pick your brain on a uh, whole some other stuff. You know what I mean? I just want to say for the last time, what we talked about is the bear entry level investing. Oh, absolutely. It's way more to investing than what we talked about. That's just the entry level. We yeah. just scratched we just scratched the service tonight. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We de we definitely got to get together. But everybody join us. Thank you for coming, but join us um the Family Wealth Club. We do um uh, a stock club with my man B. He comes in and he's you know the younger generation more in the crypto and he shares that information. Uh K Money asked a very good question earlier. Remember earlier in the year Definitely last year as well. We also used to throw those charts in there with the um, with you know the information as far as what stocks are throwing off the highest dividend. Like Neil said, you can just go to Google, put it in, and the list is spit out and whatnot. So that's something that we talk about as well. My job in there primarily is I'm in the real estate aspect, but I like to come and share real life deals with you to give you the opportunity for you and your family to take the deal. I don't maybe I can make some money off the deal. I don't care if I don't make no money off the deal. It's enough for everybody. I really don't care. Uh, I just want to give you the deal and the opportunity so we can create this, this nexus, this network um, for us to actually grow. So The Family Wealth Club, check it out. It's a new website, The Family Wealth Club. And I promise you, and you know what, for me now, it wasn't, it wasn't Rich Dad, Poor Dad that did it for me. It was cash flow, the actual gain that did it for me, that changed my life, bro. And I created a game within the game because you can play cash flow online. If you go to richdad.com, you can play online, play by myself. And um, I created a game within the game because the game shows you how to get off your job and just make enough passive income to pay your expenses where technically you don't have to work. But that's fine, but I've been mastered that. I want to learn how to get rich with the money in the bank bank, you know, the big money. 
And so I created a game within the game. In the essence, you would stay in the rat race and you have to make $10 million. I also created a quiz to quiz you because that game, once you get it, that's the know-how and simulation. Simulation is like the best thing next to experience because this is why, especially young men, be addicted to video games because it's real time. You make a mistake, you make the adjustment right there on the spot, and then it's like you're getting a real experience. This is the best game ever financially. Got Monopoly faded. Cash flow is the one. It has changed people's lives all across the world. Literally, people are playing this in Philippines, Japan, everywhere. Okay. You got to get on this cash flow thing. But in the module on the wealth, the family wealth club, there's three levels to it. Module two is the game changer. Module one is the commitment that you make and getting your mindset ready. But module two is where the game is at. When you get in there and we show you some things to help open up those pathways in the brain and develop that financial IQ and that acumen. And then being able to do it in real life is part three, where we come with deals and say, hey, Neil got a duplex that I think is great cash flow and it's pretty cheap. It's like 40K is all he want for it and we can get some money off this thing. I like the deal. Yeah, I love the deal. You know what? Who want to partner up and let's do the deal. And that way you get to learn it and experience from that part. So check it out, The Family Wealth Club. And um, closing words, Neil, because I'm about to get out here and check a property out right now, even though it's dark, but I got to do it. Well, I want to co-sign what you just said, man. Uh, the game, I play the game too. So uh -huh. I kind of included that when I said I read the book, man, but the game opens your mind, man. Yep. Opens your mind. This And the other, uh, my closing thoughts, man, is uh, invest in yourself and whatever that may be. So if you have a job, but you want to just do properties on the side, if you have a job and you want to help people start a business and own a percentage of it, but don't just depend on your money from one source. You got to have more than one source. You, you have to. You have to have more than one source, man. And so if I stop doing my business today, I'm going to do something else. You know, I might go work for somebody, but I'm going to have something on the side just all about Neil. So have more than one source. You know, it's okay work for Fifth Third Bank, but you know what? They can lay you off and then what? So I always have more than one source. Absolutely, man. Well, I appreciate you, brother. Thank everybody, man. Um, Neil, you can hit the end button on there. I'm going to okay. stop recording.